associate it with the rapture for reasons that I'm going to explain. And it's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, the judgment seat of Christ. So if you've got 2 Corinthians 5.10, I'll just read it out. And it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. <clears throat> We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive what is due for us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, I want to make two comments first. The word bad there in that verse does not particularly refer to sin. It literally means worthless. In other words, we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers and God's going to look at the good things in our Christian lives. And it's also going to be looking at the worthless things in our life, yeah? A worthless thing would like being, you know, supporting Man United Football Club. It's a complete waste of time as far as eternity is concerned. Okay, I'll leave all other football clubs aside. But, uh, you know, if I waste all my time in football, that doesn't produce any eternal fruit in my life, yeah? So that's one part of my life I've got to learn to keep under control so I don't get sucked into it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm getting involved in something that is ultimately worthless and I end up wasting my time and my energy on it. <clears throat> God won't reward me for that. That's what I'm saying here. That's what the verse says. Um, so it refers to worthless things rather than things which are sinful. Okay. Now, when you read the words judgment seat of Christ, I will guarantee you that there is something in your nature, something in your heart that immediately responds with fear Oh dear, if I've got to stand before the Lord, before his judgment seat, well, judgment seat makes me think of a judge in a court of law who's there and my sins have been exposed, as it were. I have been declared guilty for what I have done in my life and the judge is there <clears throat> and he's ready to pass sentence on me. And in my case, of course, it will always be a guilty verdict and I get sent down, yeah? and maybe even get sent down eternally, as it were. Now, that is the kind of thinking that a lot of Christians have of the judgment seat of Christ, and it's basically based on anxiety, it's based on fear, and it's based on the response of the sinful part of you, of your nature, which is still there in your heart. Nobody needs to tell you of all of the things you've done wrong in your life. Nobody needs to tell you of all the mess that you've made in your life. Nobody needs to tell you of all of the things that you are ashamed of having done or having been at some distant point in your past. Yeah, you know all about that. I know all about my life. And it's also true that Jesus knows all about those things in my life. Yeah. But the first thing I want to say is this. The judgment seat of Christ is not about sin and not about dealing with sin. OK, now this is one thing that we've got to get fixed into our minds as believers. The judgment seat of Christ is for Christians. That's why it's called the judgment seat of Christ. So that Christians that have been raptured stand before him. Yeah, it is not talking about what's called the final judgment at the end of the millennium, where all of the books are open. And it is like a court of law at the end of Revelation. And peoples are judged out of the things which are written in the books about their lives. And because their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're not believers, then they don't go to heaven. They go to the other place and they go there eternally. Yeah, that's at the end of Revelation. But here you've got something called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the first thing is this. The reason why the judgment seat of Christ does not deal with sin and the mess that, and the shame and the guilt and everything else that you feel about your life is because all of that in its complete entirety, every last iota of it has been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. If we have any fear of the day of judgment, it's because we still do not yet appreciate just how deeply God loves us in Christ and how complete God's work through Christ is for us on the cross. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the one thing that will not be brought up is the sin of our past life. 
Every sin that's been confessed, every sin that's been acknowledged, every sin that's therefore been forgiven and cleansed away, God himself says repeatedly in his word, I will remember their sins no more. Excuse me. So the first thing you do is remind yourself that everything that you did in your life before you got your life right with God, God remembers none of that. God has put it all behind his back. He has covered it all over. He has cleansed it all away and it's gone. Now, you may not rem you, you may remember it and sometimes you may choose to remember things. But and of course, if you dwell on them, then you're making a mistake because you're dwelling them on, on the past rather than your walk with God. Um, but God himself does not bring those things up. He does not remember them because they have been forgiven completely and utterly in Christ when Jesus died on the cross. Now, if you don't believe that, that simply means you don't understand what the cross is about. The cross is where your sin and my sin was dealt with completely and utterly right down to the very, very last thing that you've ever done in this life. Amen. So uh, the, the cross, therefore, is good news. Now, the other, the, the other reason why I'm mentioning this is that when you think of the judgment seat of Christ, your nature thinks, oh, judgment, I'm scared of this. You know, I don't want to stand before the Lord. Uh, but then when you think like that, you immediately forget that you are the bride of Christ. Now, when the bridegroom comes for his bride in the rapture, he's going to take us all up to heaven with him and we'll enjoy that seven year bridal week, as it's called. But when you think, oh, I've got to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat, you immediately strip yourself in your mind. You strip yourself of your identity as the bride of Christ. And you immediately go back to what you were before Christ and you start thinking of all your sin and your mess and your problems again. Yeah. Now, that's a huge mistake. You've got to train yourself to, to, to realize that none of that stuff in the past will ever appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And when you get raptured as the bride of Christ and you go to heaven as the bride of Christ, then when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you do not cease to be the bride of Christ. You're still the bride of Christ when you stand before his judgment seat. And he loves you there just as much as he loved you and why he came to, to rapture you and take you to heaven in the first place. Yeah, He doesn't love you to bits and then come for his bride with all of that anticipation and joy that we've looked at and then immediately forget that once you're in heaven and then start to get his finger out and point it at you and say, now I'm going to judge you. That, that's absolute nonsense. Yeah, When we get to heaven... Um, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but it's not about sin. Now, if I was in church and this was a Sunday morning, I would ask you, please turn to somebody, the person sat next to you, and tell them it is not about <laughs> sin. OK, so one, two, three, let's all say it. One, two, three. It's not about <laughs> sin. OK, <laughs> OK, that's as near as we can get. OK, it's not about sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and it continues to cleanse all the way through our lives. OK. Now, the other thing I want to mention is this. The word judgment seat in that verse is the Greek word bima, which is why it's often referred to as the bima seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is the bima of Christ or the bima seat of Christ. Now, if you think of the stage at church, you walk along the floor and then you actually only go at one step. And once you've gone at one step, you're on the stage. But if you want to go to the backstage, you have to climb up two or three more steps and then you're on the backstage. Yeah. Now, a beamer is just that. It's a stage. It's a raised platform to which you go by by climbing up three or four steps. Now, if somebody wanted to give a speech, they were an orator or they were a politician, they would stand on a beamer. They'd stand on a seat. We would say today they'd stand on a soapbox. Yeah, that's a beamer. It's a soapbox. It's a ra something that's raised up so people can see you when they're in the crowd. Yeah. Um, a judge would stand on a beamer. A magistrate would be on a beamer because he would be above everybody else. 
but judges at the athletics games in the in the stadiums that they used to have that would present the laurel um, the, 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 the the laurel wreath of the crown to the guy that won the race or won the chariot race, whatever it might be. He would be on a beamer and the, the, the athlete would come to him and he would present him with the beamer, yeah? If you ever watch Ben-Hur, then you've seen how Ben-Hur received his laurel wreath, yeah? And Pontius Pilate is stood on a beamer, yeah? But he's not there to judge. He's there to give a gold medal. Yes? So the word beamer, even though it's translated judgment seat in this verse, simply refers to that raised platform on which Jesus will stand and we will stand before him, okay? Now, we'll just go to um, a few verses and we'll, we'll flick through them. Um, if you go to Psalm 62, Psalm 62, <coughs> verses 11 and 12, I'm going to try to, to, to build into your minds and your thinking uh, that the Bema Seat of Christ is overwhelmingly a positive experience for believers that love Christ, that are faithful to him, and that walk through him with a heart of love through this life. Yeah? Now in Psalm 62, verses 11 and 12, it says, One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O God, are strong, and that you, O Lord, are loving, surely... You will reward each person according to what he has done. That's a positive statement. That when people stand before the Lord, they will stand before him and they will receive reward. Now, some people respond to this and say, well, I, I don't deserve anything. I, I, I'm not in this for rewards. And, I'm, you know, I, I'm not seeking to live as a Christian just so that God will give me something as a reward on, the, on, 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 the, on, on, on judgment day. <coughs> That's wrong thinking. Uh, God is essentially a God who blesses and a God who has a very positive attitude towards his children, yeah? If your child does well and they do a good turn and they've done their chores and, you know, they've been really a good, as good as gold, what do you do? You give them a reward, yeah? There's the piece of chocolate, there's the cake, there's this or that, or there's the extra spending money. It's a reward. Now, you're standing there not on a beam or raised platform, but you are giving a reward because you have evaluated what they have done and whether they were seeking for the extra bit of pocket money or not is not the issue. You still give it to them anyway because of what they've done. You, you understand, yeah? Yeah. And that's the idea there. Now, if you go to, to Timothy, we'll have a look at one verse that describes the Apostle Paul or um, where he's speaking in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, and these are some of the last words he ever wrote. Uh, the, the, the letter of 2 Timothy was written right at the end of his life, and uh, a few weeks after this, um, Paul was actually uh, executed by Nero, and he wrote these words, in verse 8, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, there's the word judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. A crown of righteousness given to me by the righteous judge. Not a sentence of condemnation, not a sentence of judgment, not, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, hunting around in Paul's life to find the smallest little bit of sin that he could possibly find and condemning him for that. That's a really negative view of God. It's a wrong view of God. But the righteous judge gives or would give Paul a crown of righteousness, a crown as an overcomer and as a reward, as a gift of honour that would mark him out in heaven amongst the people of God for the service that Paul rendered to God in his ministry and during his Christian life. Yeah. So the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, is not judgment in a negative sense. It is evaluation of your Christian life. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with before you became a Christian. It's got everything to do with your Christian life, how you serve God, 
how you've been faithful to God, how you've kept persevering in the faith, and for any fruit that you may have produced in your life and in the ministry that God has given you to do, yeah? You'll be rewarded for faithful prayer. You will be rewarded for persevering in the faith. You will be rewarded as a parent that's persevered with your children and tried to sow the seeds of righteousness in the life. You will be rewarded for ministry. You'll be rewarded for working in the church. You'll be rewarded for persevering with the children in the church and with, you know, with anything that you may have done that has produced positive fruit for the kingdom of God. God is in heaven and God is big enough and great enough to look you in the eye and say, thank you for everything that you did. Yeah, I really appreciate it. There's your medal. There's your crown. Enter into the joy of your Lord. OK, now we'll just look at um, a couple more verses. And one of them is in First John. First John, chapter four. If you do want to flip your Bible uh, pages, if you could just mute yourself while you do it and then the, the noise won't come through, uh, you'll still be able to hear me speaking, okay? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, and it says this. So we know and rely on the love that God has for us. So it's about the love of God. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have what? We'll have confidence on the day of judgment. That's the Bema seat. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So that contrast of fear and love in those verses has to do precisely with God's nature as a God of love. And the day of judgment when you stand before him. He doesn't want you to be afraid of it. He wants you, by contrast, to be confident when you stand before him. Paul was confident. Paul wasn't afraid. Paul knew, when I'm going to get to heaven, I know what I've done. I know what I was told to do. I've been faithful to it. I've tried my hardest at it. And when I get that, I know God's going to give me a crown for it. And I'm just waiting for that. I'm, I'm rejoicing in that. I'm going to go and I'm going to get it. Amen. And uh, this, this, these verses in 1 John are about the love of God. Yeah. If you fear judgment and if you fear the beam of seat of judgment, if you fear standing before Christ, it's because you're aware of sin in yourself that still hasn't been cleansed away. And you're still not yet fully understood just how much and how deeply God loves you. OK, so please turn to somebody and tell them God loves you. Can you turn to our viewers and say God? God loves you. Yeah, amen. <laughs> now, if you go back to Matthew God chapter 24. God loves you, babe. Thank you. God loves you, Helen. Matthew chapter 24. And this is where we tie in with the rapture. Um, because... Jesus said, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And we know now that that refers to the rapture. OK, that's in verse 36 of Matthew 24. But then after uh, his teaching about the rapture, you know, one will be taken, the other will be left. Jesus then speaks three parables. In fact, he speaks four parables. One of them begins in verse 45, and it's about the faithful and wise servant. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that master, that for that servant whose master finds him doing when he, when, he, when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So again, that's essentially a very, very positive statement for those who are faithful, yeah? We won't talk about those that are not faithful, okay? Because uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm exhorting you to faithfulness. Yeah, you keep on being faithful. You, you, you don't need to think about the other category of people because you know you're being faithful yourself. But what will the master do to his faithful servants? He will reward them, and he won't just reward them. He will also promote them and give them authority and put him in charge of all of his possessions. And um, we find the same thing in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. You all know the parable of the talents. 
Um, the master, the businessman, went away on a journey. He gave one servant five talents. He gave another two talents. He gave another one talent. The man with the five loved his master and went out and he multiplied it and doubled the number of talents. He, he came back with ten. The one had two, went out, multiplied them, came back with four. The one that had one was the problematic one. He did nothing with it. He went outside, he buried it. He didn't understand the nature of his master and it didn't respond in love towards him at all. Um, now, but when the master comes in verse 19, what does he do? He returns and he settles accounts with them. Now, that's the, that's the day of judgment. That's the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema seat. It's evaluation. And it's about settling accounts with us as the servants of God. You served him? Then you can sit down and you can tell him. I mean, he already knows, but you can tell him, Lord, I've done this with you. You gave me five. This is what I've done with them. I've got five more. I've got ten. Lord, you gave me this gift. And look, look what you did with it. You know, when I was faithful... You bless so many people and, and this and that and the other. And it was and there's so much fruit come out of what you've given to me. Amen. Yes. So what does he do? He settles accounts with them. You, you were given five. You've now got ten. What does he say? Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. So I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Yeah? So now we can go back to being the bride. You're raptured because you're loved as the bride of Christ. You go into heaven, you're still the bride of Christ. And you'll go in there, and yes, you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ because th th these parables about settling accounts and evaluation are given in the context of the rapture. So when you're raptured and you go to heaven, the first thing that will take place is the judgment seat of Christ. It's rewards time. It's evaluation time. It's the time for settling accounts. So come and share your master's happiness. Yeah? Now, these verses that we've been looking at are essentially very, very positive. None of them are about sin. Why? Because Jesus dealt with all of our sin. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that one in a minute. But it's essentially a very, very positive picture of the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. You know, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to yeah. being in front of him and, and, and seeing what, uh, what the Lord's going to do in my life. Amen. And there's several other verses. <coughs> if you want to read them, you can read the blog. <coughs> They're all in there. But the, the other one I want to, to look at briefly is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses um, 11 to 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 11 to 15. And this again is also talking about the beam, see? But it gives you a, it presents it in a slightly different way, Okay. And it says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So it's talking about our Christian life, not our pre-Christian life. If any man builds on this foundation in his or her Christian life using gold, silver or costly stones, wood, hay or straw, those are the worthless things that I mentioned at the beginning, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, that's the, the beamer seat, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. There's reward again. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. He will be saved. And he will be in heaven. But only as one escaping through the flames. Now, the slant that that's putting on the beamer seat, the evaluation of your life, is it's, it's, it's as though God will take the whole of your Christian life, all of your service for God, everything that you've done for the Lord, and stick it through a great big fire in heaven. God's fire. Yeah? Everything that was worthless in your life will be burnt up and it won't stand before God. It, it will go. And we will know all of the things that, that we did, even for God sometimes, that were worthless. <clears throat> but we will also become aware of the things which remain. 
The Bible says that your faith is precious as gold in the sight of God. It says that in several occasions. So the first thing that will always stand the fire of God's, uh, uh, will stand the test of God's fire is your own personal faith. It's every occasion where you've acted in faith. It's every occasion where you've stood by faith. It's every occasion, every situation where you've stood by faith and believed the promises of God in your life. Those, those things will stand. And you will be known as a heaven, uh, as a person that stood by faith, a person that prayed, a, stood, a person that stood on the promises of God and proved the promises of God that they were, that, that they were real and reliable in, the, in your daily life. Yeah, that, that's one thing about gold. <clears throat> So for all of us, there's going to be something that remains. Yeah. Now, the longer you've been in Christ and the more you've done for God and the more you've been involved in ministry, the more confident you'll be because you've seen God working more. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm very confident because I've seen God doing so much through me. I've got lots of gold, lots of silver and lots of costly stones. But I'm also aware of wood, hay and stubble, wood, hay and straw. Uh, but the more I go on in life, the more I'm determined not to use wood, hay and straw, but the more <laughs> gold, silver and precious stones, because I'm aware of that verse. Yeah, I don't want what I do to be burnt up and to be declared worthless on the day of judgment um, and only to have a few little things here and there, which are gold, silver and precious stones. I want to build using gold, silver and precious stones. I want to build people's life as a pastor and a teacher using the gold and the silver of the word of God so that it gets discipled and, and becomes part of your life and therefore your life gets built on the foundation of the word of God. That's gold for you and it's also gold for me as a pastor and a teacher, yeah? Um, but it also makes it clear in verse 15 that there's some people that get to heaven, they will be the bride of Christ, they will be saved, they will be in heaven eternally, but they're not going to receive very much of a reward, if any, because they built their life, their Christian life, and they built anything they did for God on the wrong foundation. They used the wrong materials, wood, hay and straw, instead of gold, silver and precious stones. Yeah. So this is the first um, thing where we are challenged, therefore, when we look forward to the day of the, the Bema Sea, we look forward with joy, we look forward with love. We don't look forward with fear, but we do have to um, realize that, hey, I've got to prepare myself for this proactively. I've got to prepare myself in such a way by doing the right things and doing the right things in the right way in my Christian life. Yeah. Using gold, silver and precious stones rather than wood, hay and stubble. I mean, the basic law of God is love God. And love your neighbour as yourself. Yes. If we take an honest to goodness look at our lives, can we honestly say, I love God with all my heart? Yes. Or my love for God is increasing day by day. And I do love God more now than I loved him a year ago. If you can say that, put your thumb up. Yeah. yeah. Now that is gold in your life. But it also says, um, love your neighbour. How about your neighbour? How about the people around you? How about the people that live next door to you? That's your neighbour, yeah? Your yeah, neighbour in church. Like your neighbour in church, your neighbour in the street, your, 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 your neighbour as, you, as your work colleague, yeah? Loving people, yeah? yeah. Um, so and if you go back to 2 Corinthians 5, and this will be the last one. 2 Corinthians 5, Yeah? We looked at verse 10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But if you look at verse 9, which is the verse immediately before, Paul said, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. We make it our goal to please God. I want to please God with my life. I want God to be able to look down and smile at me with joy, knowing that Mike is doing what he can to please me because he knows what pleases me. Yeah, that's in the context, context of the judgment seat of Christ. If I try to please God, if I proactively do in my life the things which I know will please God, then when I stand before the Bema seat, 
I'm going to get a response of joy and happiness from the Lord. Amen. And in verse 11, then you've got the opposite. In verse 11 says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. <laughs> Paul was an evangelist. So the reference there is actually to his work of preaching the gospel and trying to get people converted. Yeah. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. So this is not fear in a wrong sense. It's not being frightened of it. It's being fear. It's fearing the Lord, knowing that we're going to have to answer for what we did in terms of the gifts that we received and any ministry activities that we did. We fear the Lord and therefore we work hard for him because when we get to that day, we don't want to look into the eyes of Jesus and see disappointment in his eyes and disappointment towards us. Yeah. So on the one hand, you've got trying to please the Lord. And on the other hand, parallel to that, in tandem with it, you've got the fear of the Lord. And the Bible doesn't try to distinguish between them. It presents both things together. So we've got love for God, fear of the Lord, healthy fear of the Lord, and trying proactively to live a life that pleases him. And if we take those things and wrap them together, love, fear, pleasing him, that's the package that we need to live by as we prepare ourselves for standing before the Bema Seat of Christ.